Let's stand together. Put your hands together. We're going to sing about how the Lord goes before us. He follows behind us. He leads us and guides us. He's our guardian today. Come on, let's sing about it. King of love and grace, my guardian. All my hopes and fears are in your hands. I'm in your hands. Where you go, I'll go. Show me the way. Every step I take. My name's Janine, and we just want to welcome you here to our service. You guys look so awake, so good. Okay, Maddie's awake. How about that? Here. <laughs> 
Our mission here as Gateway Church is to help people take a step in the right direction, and so we hope to help you do just that today as we continue our series called Back to the Bible. And there are a lot of amazing stories in the Bible, stories of danger and courage and relationships, crime, love, good and evil. And in this series, we are looking particularly at courage and how the Apostle Paul could face challenges and still follow Jesus wholeheartedly. If you're newer here and you haven't been here maybe more than one or two times, we just want to thank you for coming and, and being our guest today and want to invite you after our time is done to head out to the guest services area. We have Ellen and Stephanie both there today and they would love to help you get to know us a little bit better and they have a little gift for you too if or as just a thank you for coming. And so I'm just going to give you a few minutes to say good morning to those around you and then we'll be right back. Whoa. I invite you to stand with me again this morning. Lift up your voice with me and sing this song that declares that the promises of God can be counted on. That what he speaks and what his word says, we can trust and we can know is true today. There's a declaration in this song and I invite you to lift it up and to make it your own. And if you've experienced what we're singing in this song, sing it out. Let's declare it this morning. When the weight of life begins to fall On the name of Jesus I will call For I know my God is in control his purpose is unshakable. It doesn't matter what I feel, doesn't matter what I see, my hope will always be your promises to me. Now I'm casting out all fear, for your love has set me free. My hope will always be your promises to me. Yeah. As I walk into the days to come, I will not forget what you have done. Supply for you have supplied my every need. Declare it now, and your presence is enough for me. Oh, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what I feel, it doesn't matter what I see. My hope will always be your promises to me. Now I'm casting out our fear, for your love has set me free. My hope will always be in your promises to me. Nothing's gonna stop the plans you've made Nothing's 
that song today there's something Lord that is so true and that is that regardless of the circumstances we face that you desire to be our foundation you desire to be our rock you desire to be our fortress so that no matter what storm comes we will be able to be strong we will be able to stand and not be shaken Lord by those storms Lord I thank you today that your name is something that we can call on that you, Lord, are one we can look to. You are the one, Lord, in whom we place our hope today. And Lord, I pray that you would allow us to not just remember that, but to respond to that, to let courage arise in our hearts today. Thank you, Lord. We can trust in our God. Thank you for your unfailing love today. Amen. Amen. Thank you for singing with us today. You may be seated to ask the ushers to come forward at this time to receive your giving. This is where we take a portion of God, what God has blessed us with it and it gives so that it may also benefit others. And we just ask that as you're doing that, that you remember the Raise Our Roof campaign. I'm sure you see we actually have a roof and walls now, so that's pretty exciting. And just a reminder, the second floor addition is not only for our use, for the students and the families and the gateway community, but it's so that we can invite more from our local community as well and fit everyone in. And so we just want to thank you for giving today. If you're a guest, please don't feel compelled to give, but if you do, of course, we welcome it. Speaking of the building program, when it began, we told you that we would have opportunities for what we call sweat equity to reduce some of our costs. And we have a, uh, something available for the guys for this Saturday coming up. We need to prepare the roof, the old roof, to become the new floor. And so Pastor Rick is looking for about 20 guys to help with that. We have a few, we need a few more. And if that's something that you can help with, you'll see that there's only one requirement, safety boots. Can't go on the site without safety boots and we have hard hats for you. And so if you wanted to help with that, you can meet with Pastor Rick in the atrium after the service and he'll get you signed up. And then next Sunday will be the final week of this series, Back to the Bible. And so then we're going to have a Gateway Sunday night. And that will be here again at the London campus at 6 o'clock. And so we invite you to come for the wrap-up of this series and an evening of worship. And then I would just encourage you to continue keeping an eye on the website and on the app for the things that are coming up in the next few weeks. For instance, Christmas outreach campaigns will be starting very soon. In fact, I noticed the Operation Christmas Challenge 
child. Boxes are in the atrium today, and I think they're due back in, in a couple of weeks, so we're really into Christmas already. And so now, I would like to invite you all to stand with me. And in preparation for Pastor Rick's talk this morning, we're going to read aloud these verses of scripture from the Apostle Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. And so let's read this together. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from the Gentiles, in danger from the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. You may be seated. In response to the scripture that we just read, I would invite you to turn to someone near you and briefly discuss these questions. Have you ever been mistreated or persecuted because of your faith in Jesus? And what danger or sufferings have you faced? Go ahead and discuss that, and we will continue in a few minutes. There's no space that his love can't reach. There's no place where we can't find peace. So I'm up here on the bridge for the first time, and I look down, and I think to myself, this is the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life. Like seriously, who takes an elastic band, straps it to their ankles, and jumps? Like this is crazy. And all of a sudden, all the things that I know about bungee jumping come rushing into my mind. I, I learned at one point that the worst bungee jump accidents happen when the cord gets wrapped around you. <clears throat> or, in really, really bad cases, it just breaks, and then you're in free fall. But you know what, I'm not even worried about those things as much as I'm worried about my back or my neck. I don't want to get whiplash. I don't want to have a hurt back from this adventure. There are very few things that we can guarantee in life with 100% certainty. Taking a leap is often risky. You see, there's a chance that if you go for a new job or try out a new university, that it will be a terrible flop. But you know what? It could be amazing. If you start a new relationship, it could be awful and you could get hurt. But it could also make your life complete. Or if you're thinking about prayer and meditation and diving into a life of faith, it's terrifying and even awkward. But you know what? To transform your life. In the scriptures and in the church, we have this great phrase, you are not alone. Or another way of looking at it is we are not alone. That the love of God is always with us. And we may take the leap and it may go terribly and God is with us. We are not alone. And we may take the leap and it will transform us and God will be there celebrating with us because we are not alone. Or, or maybe you walk to the edge of the platform, you've got your harness on, you're ready to leap, and you decide that you can't do it. So you walk back, you take off the harness, and you walk off the bridge, and you decide that there's another leap for you some other time in your life. And if you do that, you're not a failure because God is with you.
what does it risk if you take the leap? Courage. Courage has many faces. Courage comes in many packages. It takes courage to jump off a cliff. I was watching that segment and thinking to myself, it takes, <clears throat> contrary to popular belief, it takes courage to face you every Sunday morning. <laughs> How about the face of courage in people's lives? The courage that it takes to face cancer. An enemy that threatens to take your loved one away. The courage of a single mother to raise her family. The courage of the widow to face her last years alone, the courage of a child when parents are divorcing, the courage to get out of bed in the face of depression, those who struggle with mental health. They're all stories of courage, your, your story, my story, our story, and they all require courage. And how we define courage, how do we measure it or quantify it? As I said last week, I wish I could just open up a can of Coke. That's courage. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not a cat <laughs> for more reasons than one. What's the difference between courage and cowardice? And how do we move forward in the face of cowardice, cowardice or courage? And, 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 and by what title or by what measure do we experience that in our own lives? Is it about the words that we speak? I think we can create a lot of anxiety in our lives. With our words, we, we can create a lot of fear. In our church here, we talk a lot about words of life versus words of death, that we can speak into being. Our words have the power of creativity. We, we create an atmosphere of courage or an atmosphere of cowardice, just the way we, we, we talk. We can talk ourselves into just about anything. We can consequently talk ourselves out of a lot of things as well. Or our approach, how we approach life. Do we approach life with a positiveness? Uh, uh, do we approach life that I can do this and, and it's going to become something great? Are we fearful and hold back? The voices, the voices that speak into our lives, into our lives the, the voices that we allow to speak into our souls. Someone said if we ate a, eat a steady diet of what the media offers, we shouldn't be surprised if we get a stomachache. One has to listen to the television or look on to different media sources and it's nothing but fear, nothing but anxiety, nothing but cowardice. There's, there's hardly a voice today that speaks encouragement. There's hardly a voice today that speaks courage. You can do it in going forward. We let those voices speak to our souls, and if we do too long, it can kill the courage in our lives expectations, shame. I think as well many times our past speaks to cowardice or courage. We failed before. We tried it. It didn't work. What's the use? We walk in shame of our sin or saying, you know what, I've, I've tried to overcome. I've tried to be victorious. I've, I've tried to stand up and have the courage. And our past can create a paranoia, a cowardice in our lives saying, you know what, I've given up trying to be brave. Bravery is one of the words that, that I think is important for us when we consider the areas where we need courage. Do I need bravery in the face of danger to, to stop running away? Do, do I need to be steadfast? Courageousness is a sense of steadfastness in, the, in opposition that says, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to give in. I'm going to hang on. Courage is the action that we, we exercise in the face of resistance that says, I'm not going to be intimidated. I will stand firm in this situation. Or optimism in the face of despair that though everything looks bleak, everything looks like it's never going to come together, that resolve that says, I will not lose heart. I will keep going forward. And as we look at the life of Paul, the apostle, the leader, the example before us, it's so easy for us to see his courage and think, I don't have what it takes. I'm not Paul. There's no way that I can identify with him. I was thinking that as I was reading these words again. Flogged and beaten and shipwrecked. Shoot, threaten me and I run like a, like a chicken. Like I, I just, I don't know how he had that in him and, and, and in the flesh, in our ordinary, we can read those words and we can say, oh, Paul was a man of extraordinary courage. But the point that I want us to see in this entire series is that it isn't that Paul was an extraordinary man of courage. Paul was a man who was full of the Holy Spirit and it was the Spirit of God in him that gave him courage. 
And it's encouraging for us. It gives us hope because if Paul did it in the flesh, then Paul is a unique person. But because Paul says it was not I, it's not me, it's not anything that I could do, but it was the power of the Spirit in me. So if that same Spirit was in Paul, that same Spirit can be in you and I. That you and I can have the courage to face whatever it is we need to face today. Paul's not any more special than you and I when we're filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to talk to you today about another aspect of courage or, or another source where we might find courage today. I want to talk to you today about the courage of praise. I want to talk to you about the courage of praise today. And it's found in the story of Acts chapter 16. It's the story of Paul and Silas. Let me read you the story today. Once, when we were going to a place of prayer, Paul's writing here, he says, we were met by a slave girl who had a, a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling, and this girl followed Paul and the rest of us. And everywhere he went, she was shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. And she kept us up for many days. It was probably our sarcastic expression. Paul finally became so troubled or angry that he turned around and looked at the girl, and he, and he said to the spirit, in the name of Christ, come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left. When the owners of the slave girl realized that, that, that the hope of making more money was gone, that whatever Paul had done, they had lost their income stream, they seized Paul and Silas. They dragged him to the marketplace, and they, they brought him in front of the magistrates, and they said, these guys, are, these Jews are kind of messing with our world. They're, they're advocating for customs that are unacceptable to our practices. And so the crowd kind of joined in with them, and they attacked Paul and Silas, and they, they ordered them to be stripped and to be beaten. And after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown thrown into prison. The jailer there was commanded to guard them very, very carefully. And so once he got those orders, he put them into the inner cell. They didn't put them in the outer cell. Put them in the inner cell, that, that, the deepest, the darkest, the, the worst place of the dungeon. He fastened them and their feet into stocks. It was about midnight. We don't know how many hours they were there, but, but around midnight hour, Paul and Silas, they're, they're praying and they begin to sing psalms to God. And as they're singing and giving praises to God, other prisoners, they begin to hear and they're listening to them. And suddenly there was this violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison, they began to be shaken. And all at once, all of the prison doors begin to fly open and everybody's chains fall off. The jailer wakes up. When he sees the prison doors open, he draws about a sword. He's about to kill himself because if those prisoners escaped, it would cost him his life. Paul shouted at the jailer. said, no, 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 don't harm yourself. We're all here. Nobody's left. The jailer calls for lights and they rush in and he falls trembling before Paul and Silas. And he looks at them and says, oh, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, both you and your household. When they spoke this word to him, he believed. And then all of the others in his house, for at that hour, the jailer, he took them and he washed their wounds. Immediately, he and his family, he baptized them. And the jailer brought them into his house and he gives them a meal. And he's filled with joy because he had finally come to believe in God, both he and his entire family. When the sun rose and it became daylight, the magistrate sent the officers to the jailer and said, release these guys. You can go in peace. And the officers said, you, no, no, no. Paul said, no, 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 no. You're not going to get away with that easy. You beat us publicly without a trial and we're Roman citizens. You threw us into prison. You don't want to get rid of us quietly? Uh, no, no, no. Let them come and escort us out. And, and then when the magistrates heard this, of course, they, they get all nervous. And so they go to Paul and Silas because they didn't know they're alarmed. They go to Paul and Silas and they appease them. They escort them from the prison and ask them to leave the city. People in our culture today have a thing about standing up for rights. <clears throat> We're consumed with what people say about other people and, 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 or what they do. And, and our world is, is just seems to be so obsessed with what we say or what we don't say and what's politically correct and what's going to be offensive and, and the word of tolerism and you can't say this and you can't say that and you can't do this. We talk about things like bullying and sexism and gender inclusivity what people say and do to one another and the events that happen are now reported and played out in various media streams even before the news can show it at 6 o'clock. 
And with that comes public opinion and outrage. And, and we try, we judge, and we execute our own judgments and condemnation with a, with a flick on our phone and a couple of nasty emoticons there, I told you. You put your opinion out there, or your view out there in media, and unless it's puppy dogs or kittens or suck face selfies, you're going to get someone going to criticize you. I mean, I, I got to tell you, I'm just amazed. If you're one of those people who puts your opinions, your controversies, if you put your thoughts out there on Facebook or various feeds, and you put it out there, and, and, and you, you, know, you let the world know what you think, and you think nobody's going to respond, you're a special kind of stupid don't stick your chin out there if you don't want somebody to take a swipe at you. We don't do well when we're wronged, are we? We whine and we complain and we apologize or we excuse and you hurt my feelings. <laughs> the fact is, most of us have never experienced a violation of our rights. Most of us have never, ever been drawn on the carpet because of our religious freedoms. We don't know firsthand what the meaning of the word persecution truly is. Who of us have been jailed falsely, accused, or denied our civil rights, or been ostracized because of our faith or our beliefs or our values? For most of us, not today. But perhaps, and most assuredly, tomorrow. Yusef Nankardi became a Christian at the age of 19. He went on to become an ordained minister and he led a church in Iran. He's now 38 years old and married with two young children. In 2010, he was arrested and sentenced to death for apostasy, converting to Christianity from Islam. After a sustained international pressure, the decision was reversed in September of 2012. But during his trial, the pastor refused to recant his beliefs despite facing the death sentence. He told the judge, I am resolute in my faith and in my Christianity, and I have no wish nor will to recant. The United Nations Foreign Secretary, uh, Secretary William Hague paid tribute to his courage, describing him as an inspiringly brave and courageous Christian. Perhaps some of you have been ostracized at work for saying the right thing. Some of you might have been passed over as a, for a promotion because you're a Christian or in your mindset, maybe not even if it's spoken. Maybe your spouse or your family member treats you with contempt because of your Christian convictions. And there are moments when that has happened. But who of us has been called upon to take a stand that might require our freedom, that might require our assets, that might require our liberty? Few of us know the kind of persecution experienced by those in, in former or present communist countries or those that are held in, in strongly Muslim countries. They could more effectively preach the story in our text than ever I could. But please, let's be sure today, the gospel is a dangerous message and it's becoming an increasingly more and more a dangerous message. I believe that as it becomes increasingly more and more dangerous, you better know why you are. It's high time that we take responsibility for our faith and our convictions today because more and more people are opposing it. And even in our quiet, polite Canadian culture, there is a growing, growing intolerance for who and what we believe in. God help us to have a courage to have a voice in the days to come. As Roman citizens Paul and Silas had a right to a trial before punishment, Romans were exempt from public beatings, and yet they were falsely accused, beaten, thrown into an inner prison, their feet locked into stocks without any resemblance of a trial. Their rights are violated, and if anybody had a right to be angry, to protest, they did. But Paul and Silas find themselves in a very difficult prison of oppression and suffering, and I just, I, I, I pause today to think that maybe some of you can identify in some way to a prison. Maybe you're not being opposed for your Christian faith, but you're in a prison today. There is something that is chaining you, something that is barring you, something that is keeping you. And you wish you could break free. You wish you could walk in victory. You desire to have the courage to move forward in those things in your life, but something has got a hold of you. And I wanted to encourage us today that there is a source of courage. God have us, help us to have a courage to praise. But in order to find the courage to praise, we must first be honest and acknowledge that prisons are a place of misery. 
No one wants misery. No one looks for misery. When Paul arrived in Philippi, they were expecting great things to happen. God had led them. They were, they were expecting great things. They had just let this girl free from, from, from the enemy. These men were doing the Lord's will and the Lord's work. They were in the exact center of God's will and God's plan for their lives, and yet trouble still came. And their character was assassinated. And there were false accusations by men who cared only for money and lying and scheming to, to get their way. They, they lost their liberty. They were enthroned. They were taken to a, a prison. They were arrested. And like a, a pack of rabid dogs, the crowds haul them into court where they are beaten and, and falsely accused. And they lost their place. They were handed over to a jailer, put into prison, and understand that those modern prisons are not, are, are, those prisons that we have today are like a five-star resort hotel compared to what they were in. Thrown into a deep, dark cell that would have been the nastiest of places you could ever imagine. And then chained into the filth and the mud and the, uh, of human waste. It would have been a dark and disgusting, nauseating place. And it reminds all of us today that there are going to be some, some rough times and for some of you right now, maybe you're in a really good place right now. But you don't measure the best of God. You don't measure the will of God based on the place that you are in. You can be in a great place today and you can be out of the will of God. You can be in a terrible place today. You can be in a prison today and be in the will of God. I'm not saying that if you're in a good place today that you're sinning or disobeying God. I'm just saying that you don't measure the goodness of God based on the place that you're in. There's going to be some tough times. You will find your place in a prison of misery and suffering. Sometimes it'll be worse than you could ever imagine. A spouse dies, disease comes, children rebel, marriages fail, and sometimes life hurts, and with, with it comes deep prisons, and all of the good deeds, and all of the good prayers, and all of the good hopes, and all the good wishes and good thoughts will not prevent you from being in that prison. Courage isn't courage until it is tested and made true. Right. I know that it's not what anyone wants to hear today, but those are the facts that the Bible declares. There will be places of misery along the path of your life, but we also need to remember that in your worst misery, it can also be a place of great ministry. God can take you to a very dark place. He can take you to a very painful place. He can take you to a very place of deep suffering, but it can be a place of great ministry and great promise. Paul and Silas found themselves in this prison and they're hurt and they're humiliated. They, they'd follow the Lord's eating, leading and now in this place, in their hour of need, there was no one that they could turn to and yet these men knew something that so many of us never get a handle on and I wish, I wish in my heart today that you will catch this today. They knew that the source of courage in their life and in that difficult situation was to turn their voice to praise. Paul and Silas begin singing songs of praise to God. They begin to praise God with their mouths. They open up their mouths and they do. And, and while they're in a terrible place, in a miserable place, they begin to serve the Lord by praising Him. In events that did not make sense, where they've been lied to, where they have been wounded, where they are bleeding, yet their mouths are filled with praise to God. And way too often in our daily struggles, way too often when we go through difficult things, we limit our praise, we limit our worship, we limit the song in our lives to a Sunday morning check in the box. <coughs> I went to church. I got my Jesus on. I sang the three songs, whether I like them or not. I've done my praise for the week. And I understand that sometimes it really is a sacrifice to offer praise. I know there are times when you don't feel like it. I know that there are times when you're struggling and when you're weary. I know that there are times when we do feel like maybe God has let us down or you look at your circumstances and you've got nothing really to sing about. When we think God seems distant, like he's far away or that he doesn't care. But when we make the decision to fix our eyes on him and not on our circumstance and to declare in daily our praise and our worship to God that says regardless of the prison, regardless of the place, I will praise him no matter what. That is when that which holds you back will begin to be released. Amen. Oh, that God would give us the courage to praise him. 
Oh, that God would give us the courage to praise him. For there are power, there is power in our words and in our voice and in our declaration of faith. And he is worthy of above all else to be praised and to be worshipped even though you don't feel like it. The song that we began, we were singing today, it doesn't matter how I feel, it doesn't matter what I think. Praise gets the focus off ourselves and back onto God. In our often selfie focused world, we need this reminder that life is not about us. Life is not about your happiness. Life is not about everything being great and wonderful for you. We know that in our heads, but our heart feels differently and we're prone to selfishness. And so when you praise in your difficult circumstances, you take it off yourself and you put it back onto God where it truly belongs. Praise brings us to a place of humility and we remember our dependency on God because we acknowledge that our need is for him, not for, for a freedom from our situation, but because the focus is about him and are recognizing that we are not in control, but God is in control ultimately of our lives. Praise makes the enemy stand back and flee. It pushes back the darkness it, and it blocks the attack over our lives. Carrie Job, a worship leader and writer of, of some of the wonderful music that we sing, she wrote this. She said, I have such a desire to go to war for people's lives and to help them overcome the enemy through their worship and through the declarations of who, she, uh, who he is with their mouth. She goes on to say, it's astounding how many people just don't live in the complete authority that we have over the enemy. He does not have any power unless we give it to him. Cowardice gives the enemy a foothold in our lives when we, when we withhold praise in our prison. Praise makes room for God's presence and deliverance over our lives. God will not hold back his goodness when we praise him. And many times we're in difficult circumstances and we say, oh God, where are you? Oh God, where are you? And God says, quit asking me where I am. I'm right here. And it's not about asking me where I am. It's about opening your mouth and saying, regardless of where I am, I know that you are worthy of my praise. And we have a choice. You and I have a choice today. To live in an absor absorbed in our own worry, our own anxiety, our own stress, to, to cowardly hold back, to shrink back from, from God's best calling in our lives, or we have a choice to stand up and to stand firm and with our mouths declare the glory and the power of the sovereign almighty God over our lives, over our situations, in spite of the prisons. Amen. Charles Spurgeon said, any fool can sing in the day. It's easy to sing when we read the notes by daylight. But the skillful singer is he who can sing when there's not a ray of light to read by. Songs in the night come only from God. They're not in the power of men. When we find ourselves in one of the, the bitter prisons of life and we turn to the Lord for our help, God can take our sign and he can turn it into song. He takes our trial and brings about a testimony. He can take our pain and bring about praise. Look at this, verse 25. And the prisoners heard... The prisoners heard. Some of you are in prison. Some of you are in difficult situations. And when was the last time you opened your mouth and declared praise to God in spite of your circumstances? Well, I pastor, you don't understand. I'm, I kind of a, my worship is a private thing. My Christian faith is a private thing. It's just between, you know, me and God. God wants you to open your mouth. Many of you are not free. Many of you go through some terrible situations and difficult circumstances and you're saying, oh, when is God going to set me free? God says, when you open your mouth and declare it. When you open your mouth and declare it. It says that the prisoners listened intently. But they were amazed by what they were hearing. Think about this. Paul, we don't know how long the other prisoners there, but Paul and Silas have only been there for a few hours. The rest of the prisoners, they could have been there for days, months, or years. So you want to talk about prisons. These guys have only known prisons. They hear him. They hear them praising God. They're not moaning. They're not groaning. They're, they're worshiping God. They're declaring the power and the glory of God. I just want to remind you today that the world is watching us. The world is listening to us. Hey, the world, your friends, they don't give a hoot about you when your life is going well. But I'll tell you, if you declare your faith as a Christian, they'll watch. They'll watch you in your prison. They'll watch you in the difficulty. 
They know everybody can rejoice when, they, when it's in the light of day. Everybody can rejoice when things are good. But what happens when things are not good? What happens when your world's falling apart? That's when your friends are watching. That's when the world is watching. That's when unbelievers are saying, now let's see how much of a Christian they are. And we've seen Christians on both sides of this, haven't we? You have, I have. I've seen Christians that fall to pieces when trouble comes and something goes bad and it's like, ah, where's God? God's given up on me. God's forsaken me. Ah. You've been a Christian for 10 years, 20 years, and all you've got is, ah. that's the best you got after 20 years? They get mad and they shake their fist and it's the pastor's fault and they go to another church because maybe they'll, God will give them better favor at the other church. Where's God in all this? And the big phrase I hear is, after everything I've done for God, which is about that much, folks, <laughs> compared to what he's done. And I've seen others go through terrible things terrible things and they are not broken they are not shaken and they will not curse God and die but they resolve to serve they resolve to worship they resolve to praise no matter what Amen. and the difference is courage yes. The difference is courage to say, my God is real when things are going well, and my God is real though my world falls apart, for he is God, and his grace is all sufficient for me. That's courageous living. And the foundations of the prison were shaken, and all of a sudden, God moves, and the prisoners and and the chains are set free. And did you, did you catch the part of the story? It didn't say that Paul and Silas were set free. It says that God's power shook the prison and everyone was free. Amen. Could it be that God could put you in a prison so that when you declare praise, God sets not only you free, but he sets your family free. He sets your friends free. He sets the school free. He sets the workplace free. That God puts you in a prison to set others free. Is that okay? Is that okay? Yes. You give your life to Jesus Christ and surrender to him and you say, Lord Jesus, take my life. You be Lord and Savior over my life. I surrender myself to you. You come into my life and you take authority over my life and God says, okay. Okay, I'll do just that. And I may crush you in the meantime. Is that okay? Because when I crush you, your testimony of praise, your courage of praise will set the world free. Sometimes you don't get the answers. Sometimes God will send you into a prison and you may never know what happens. The psalmist said, God is our refuge and strength and a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed and the mounds be carried in the midst of the seer. I can tell you one thing. You can count on being treated wrongly in this world. If not today, tomorrow. But we are living in very, very difficult times. We are living in times that are going to come with increasing challenge. We are in a world where Christianity is going to be more and more attacked. And you better know why you are one. You better know why you are one while it's, while it's light of day because if you don't know why you're a Christian in the light of day, you'll never be one in the dark of night. You better get this figured out. For some of you who just come to church Sunday after Sunday and the, and the extent of your Christian faith is little more than a 75-minute service, I'm just telling you now, you better get this figured out. Because there will come a sifting, there will come a shaking, there will come a, a changing of the guard, and our world is becoming increasingly more and more intolerant and more and more hostile. You better figure this out. First Peter says, Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. Don't be surprised. 
because being a Christian takes courage because God never said that you could get through life without it because being a Christian is not a get out of tribulation and trial contract. But I can tell you this, when you are treated wrong, you can trust that God will always do right. I don't know, but I have a hunch that most of us, if we had been where Paul and Silas were, as if we were praying at midnight, it wouldn't have been, oh God, I glory and praise you. It would have been, oh God, get me out of here. That's what my praise probably would have sounded like. Oh God, get me out of here. If that's what they had been praying, then as soon as God had set them free, they would have went, I'm out of here. But they didn't. They knew that God had a purpose in mind. If you and I had been praying, oh God, get us out of here. If at that moment, the chains had fallen off, at that moment, if the prison doors had opened, wouldn't you have said, that's the deliverance of God and left? What did they do? They stayed inside. And they compelled all the other prisoners to stay inside too. The real issue is when you are treated wrongly, will you trust in the sovereign, omnipotent, almighty, all power of a God who could have prevented the situation that when he sets you free, you will understand that you are being set free for a reason, for a purpose, and for his plan. Malcolm Muggeridge, another great Christian writer, said, contrary to, might be ex- to what might be expected, when I look back on the experiences of my life, that at the time that it has seemed especially desolation in my life, when times in my life were particularly painful, I can say with complete truthfulness that everything that I have learned in my 75 years on this world, everything that has been truly enhanced and enlightened in my experiences has been through affliction and not through happiness. God, give us the courage to praise and to allow him to turn the prison of our pain into the prison of our praise. Would you bow your heads with me today? If you're in a prison right now and you need God to open some doors for you, I want you just to wave your hand and wave it at me. If you're in a prison right now, if something is holding you back, yes, those hands, yes, those hands. God, you know what? There's nothing about raising your hand. It's just having courage. If you can't praise him, try waving a hand. It's a good start. If you're in a prison today, you need to just acknowledge that. Yes, hands all over the place. I want to pray with you today. Father, I thank you today for the song that can be in our heart. Lord, we praise you for your faithfulness. We praise you for your great power and your love in spite of the difficult circumstances that we find ourselves today. Father, together we confess our need for you and our lives are are, are in desperate need for you today. We struggle. We we get weary. we, We worry. We're worn out. Yet you never leave us. Your presence is always with us. You're always caring for us. You're always ready to breathe renewal into our souls. We ask you today, I ask you today, that you would fill us with a spirit of courage by the power of the Spirit over every person whose hand was raised and said, Lord, I can't do this on my own. Because in my own, all I want to do is get out of this prison. I want to encourage you today that if you if that's you today that from this day on you would stop praying for freedom from the prison and you would start praying for the courage to praise instead of focusing so much on God get me out of here that your prayer would be God be glorified while I'm in here God While I'm here, I lift up your name. God, while I'm here, let me glorify you with my speech. Let my phrase, let my mouth, let my attitude, let my actions demonstrate the power of a resurrected God. God, I'm going to stop focusing on the prison. I'm going to start focusing on the praise. Fill us with the courage to praise. May we find the fortitude to stand firm and declare your glory and your majesty and your victory in our lives, prison or not. 
And if you're here today and this is all new to you and you're kind of hearing some of this stuff and it's kind of freaking you out, but you're still in a prison, I want to invite you just to quietly say, Jesus, I don't get it all, but can you come into my prison right now? I'm tired of being in this prison by myself. Can you come in and be in prison with me? And maybe together we can figure this thing out. For those of you who raised your hand and those who didn't, I want you to do one, a couple of things for me right now. We're going to sing a song, and as we do, I want you to, I want you to stay seated, and I want you to sing this song quietly until you have the courage to stand. And please don't be like sheep and peer pressure. And once you hear all the bodies going up, you go up with them. Oh, it's time to stand now. No, 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 no. Stay seated until you have courage. Whatever it is that you're asking God for, whether you ever get set free, stay seated until you have the courage to praise him, whether you ever get out of that prison. And I also want to encourage you that you stay here long enough. I'm going to let you go. But I want you to stay long enough that you have enough courage for the week to come. That you will stay here and you will keep praising him. And if you don't want to sing it, then just read the words and speak the words out loud. Praise doesn't always have to be in a melody. But I want you to keep saying the words, singing the words. I want you to praise him and declare his glory until you have enough courage. Can you do that today? God grant us the courage, prison or not, to declare his glory, to live in his victory.
years ago when I was growing up, there was there was a song that was sung. It was back in the 70s and the 80s. Anybody of you remember those? 70s and 80s? Yeah, me too. And you know what? I grew up listening to this song. My wife just reminded me of it. I think she did partly because it's one of her favorite songs, but also because there is a message and a truth in this song that I think can be very, very powerful for our hearts today. And uh, some of you may remember this. I'm going to play it in G, guys. It goes like this. When you're up against a struggle that shatters all your dreams and your hopes have been cruelly crushed by Satan's manifested schemes in, no matter what kind of a situation you're in, to lift up your voice and to praise Him, and to know that He will do something amazing. He will open up those prison doors. He will cause those shackles to, to just drop off because He's already won the battle. He is King of kings and He is Lord of lords today. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are victorious. We thank you, Lord, that your name has power as we sung about today, Lord. Your name has the power to save us in every way that we need to be saved. And Lord, our response to that is to praise you in the midst of those circumstances, to lift up our voices and to declare our trust in you, O oh God, and our hope in you. Lord, I pray that the praise of God will be on our lips this week. The praise of God will be in our hearts this week, that it'll be in our minds. We won't be able to escape it. And that, Lord, you will inspire songs of praise as we say, about today to, to bring that song of praise out of our hearts we love you today we praise you today 
Lord, give us the courage to praise you in the midst of the storm. May we praise you today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you. Have an amazing day. We'll see you soon.